I think you're going to find the video discussion to be very inspiring. It's going to give you a lift, maybe the kind of lift that you've been needing for a very long time. This video is the second part of a discussion that Mitch and I had a short while ago. I contacted Mitch after seeing an amazing video that he put together, um, presentation uh, for TED Talks. I was blown away by his sincerity, uh, his intelligence, and his heartfulness. To my mind, this man represents a modern day hero. Uh, both his intention as well as what he's been achieving is something phenomenal, um, and it's getting a lot of widespread recognition. But one of the things that strikes me the most about Mitch is his modesty. Uh, he's not doing what he's doing for accolades. Uh, he's doing what he's doing to really make a difference, you know, to help people. I mean, certainly you can see self-actualization just brimming and bristling off him. Uh, it's, it's radiant. One of the reasons that this strikes me in particular, uh, his approach, uh, his spirit, is um, something that I've personally witnessed uh, for a large number of years. Back in the 80s and 90s, around that era uh, in the area that I lived, there was a lot of support for people that were artistic or creative, intelligent. Um, not everything was paved over to make way for corporate shopping malls. If you wanted to go out and you know uh, meet with people of like minds and, and like hearts, it wasn't such a chore to do. You had to look around a little bit. You had to make a bit of an effort. Um, I remember one spot, it was called uh, Old Strathcona, White Avenue. It was in a city in Canada called Edmonton. And for blocks and blocks and blocks, you had a number of little shops, but they weren't like your franchises or malls. They were run by kind of the mom and pop, you know, or the individual that was creative. And I recall one bookstore in particular where I would go in. It wasn't that big. Uh, it was a secondhand bookstore. It had a few little tables on the inside, and they would serve, you know, handmade lattes, and the staff would talk with the customers. It was very common to walk into this bookstore and see people sitting around at the same table having conversations about all manner of topics. And you would see at the same topic, um, you know, a lawyer, a, a punker, um, someone that was, you know, somewhat gothic, you know, a university prep student. And there was a meeting of minds. There wasn't, a, you know, a lot of chaos or disagreement. And they would talk about things that were meaningful. On a Saturday afternoon, on the summer when the, when the sky was blue and the clouds were out, you could go walking down the street and there were all kinds of, um, you know, people from different backgrounds gathering. And so you felt like there was a real community there. When I was listening to Mitch um, and I was asking him questions in this part of our discussion, uh, I was blown away that this person had not lost sight of what so many people have lost sight of in this modern age. Um, you know, he's making a difference. He is working with technology and science and, you know, he is making progress in a lot of different areas, but he hasn't lost sight of what those most important elements of humanity are really supposed to be about. So in this, con in this conversation, um, I'm asking him questions, you know, basically about his outlook on life. You know, what does he think made a difference for him as a person? Uh, if you haven't seen his TED talk, um, I really recommend that you do so and check out his, his sites and, and websites. But basically, in, in this video, we talk about how to do what you love. Um, how can you heal from past wounds? You know, if you're someone that suffered from depression or you've had a lot of challenges in life, uh, Mitch shares a lot of his insights. Uh, also, how can you escape, you know, a bad situation? Uh, how can you make your reality a better place? How can you make meaningful and purposeful, you know, contributions to other people? Uh, Mitch also discusses hacker spaces and the maker movement. And so he makes comments about how to bring magic into your life. Um, fortunately, even though we had some technical problems, all the most important things that Mitch shares with us are, you know, easily heard and viewed in this video. Uh, for some weird reason, when we were doing this conversation, I had some tech problems. And you won't see my image on the right-hand part of the screen. Uh, it just didn't show up. And a lot of the uh, video and audio in our discussion didn't make it through. Uh, and you don't hear a lot of my voice, but that's not important. Uh, what's important is that, you know, we were able to ask uh, Mitch some meaningful questions and the most important parts of his responses got through. I hope you enjoy this. Uh, I felt amazing during the conversation and afterwards, and I hope that that comes through to you. Enjoy. 
uh, hackerspaces are really, well, they've been around for a while, but in its current state, just since 2007. So it, it's really a new phenomenon, and it's really taking over. There's over 1,500 hackerspaces in the world existing or forming at the moment and growing quickly. There are places, physical places, where there is supportive community for people to explore and to do what they love. And whatever that might be, and it's very different for different people, but there's a lot of overlap in, in, in a lot of us. Uh, so not only tech, which most people think of when they think of hacking um, and computers, but also art and craft and uh, uh, science and food and uh, all, any, any kind of realm like this. Uh, Noisebridge is the hackerspace that I co-founded in San Francisco. It's a very diverse place. We've got uh, about 500 square meters, uh, 5,200 square feet of just total chaotic madness and wonderfulness. And uh, we're open 24 hours a day, and there's like 350 people who come by every week, uh, all doing different things. We've got a dark room for film. We've got people who do music and make their own musical instruments or just come and play. Uh, we've got people doing visual art. We've got people doing toothpick toothpick sculptures, uh, people teaching uh, human languages like German or Mandarin, people teaching computer languages like uh, um, Python or Ruby or C++. Um, we've got people doing all sorts of things with colored lights. We've got people doing things with brain waves, uh, all sorts of things like this. Uh, and the idea is we uh, have been failed by our education system. Uh, we were trained by our education system in rows and columns responding to bells with an authority at the front telling us what we need to pair it back on a test. Uh, that doesn't help us live lives we really want to live. Uh, that may at one time have trained people to be good little workers in the industrial era, but whether or not it trained people well for that, the industrial era is no longer upon us. Whatever we are living in is not the industrial era, and our education system isn't preparing us to live lives that we feel are way worthwhile. And that's really a shame because they could. But given that they're not in general, uh, hackerspaces are places where people can come together and learn what they want to learn to live the lives they want to live. And uh, to explore and to do what they really love in their lives whatever that might be, what they're passionate about. And these are places that are supportive for that. So if we don't know what we love, because you know, we're kind of out of practice at this in our modern world, um, we don't have enough time to explore it. At hackerspaces, people make the time for this and support each other in just about anything. And if you know something, uh, you know, just about anyone knows things that others don't like. And the hackerspaces are places where people can share what they know and love that other people can benefit. And each hackerspace is unique, so, uh, and they all help each other. So I've been in the world doing workshops, teaching people how to make cool things with electronics, because that's one of the things I love. And I'm also, as it turns out, um, pretty good at helping people form supportive communities that are good for them and uh, help them form it in a way that works for them and for communities that already exist to help people um, you know, thrive in their communities. Community is a lot of hard work. You know, we're not well trained in it in our modern world, uh, but we need it. We need community. It's part of why we survived as a species uh, on the planet because we got together and supported one another. Uh, we couldn't have done it just as individuals. We're not strong so we can go out and just conquer, you know. We have to come together and support each other to make our lives better and make tools to uh, help ourselves in, in sometimes hostile world, uh, sometimes beautiful world. But whatever we come together and do, we can make our lives better. And uh, hackerspaces are one model uh, within which we can get better at this. Uh, but it's still a lot of hard work, so we need people to go around and help people when there are problems with community, because uh, there's always going to be conflict. Uh, but if we can get 
beyond our conflict, uh, you know, work with each other to resolve any misunderstandings, uh, then our communities really work and we grow from there and the communities get stronger. And this is growing like crazy. Uh, right now, there's like 1,500 of these hackerspaces existing or forming, like I said, but that and that provides you know, like a hundred some thousand people with opportunities they didn't have before. That's not enough. There's seven billion of us on our planet. We need like a million hacker spaces so people can walk to one near them and and experience uh, the joys and the opportunities available. Um, so that's what I've been focusing on lately, and uh, so have a lot of other people. And I really like what it uh, has possibilities for more opportunities for more people. You know, the way that it strikes me, it's just, it's a very subjective thing that I'm about to say, but, it, um, you know, uh, one, one of the, there's a number of different kinds of conversational threads that, that go uh, on uh, within our community, and one of these is um, uh, a kind of disgruntlement that there is such a division, um, uh, a cognitive and emotional division between uh, what we uh, call, through different, you know, terms or labels, spirituality, uh, science and art, and, um, and then, you know, I, for myself and, and a number of our other senior members, you know, there's a, a kind of a, a recognition and a, and a desire, you know, to see a fusion of these three things into a greater whole. And as I as I listen to you now, and, and in in all of the things that I've heard, uh, right back to the very first TED talk that I saw you give, uh, to me, what, what the way it came across was that here what we're doing really is we're taking a you know a, a higher spiritual principle and to, and also you know, the greatest uh, virtues and, and character that, that we may aspire to and instead of it being just talk and instead of it being only in the imaginal realm uh, what we're actually seeing through the work that you're doing is a, a concretion a manifestation a very literal physical demonstration of these things uh, you know it's uh, someone very close to me uh, came up with this term that, that she that she she calls uh, practiplation, you know, where it's it's like you know how how do we play, uh, how can we be practical, you know, how do we fuse these things? Be, because you know it's, if you take a look at someone who's a visionary or they're artistic or you know if they're intuitive, uh, one of the challenges that they face is that they're in a system and a structure that is not designed to facilitate or support them. It is designed to uh, you know either crush them or discard them and so I think what you're doing is that you're saying well you know what um, first of all yes the educational system uh, has been intentionally designed to make sure that we're all little cogs in a, in a greater you know lifeless uh, machine without vitality but we don't have to do that we, we can actually take these higher parts of us and we can do something real with it. And that's the impression I get that, you know, that what you're doing. Yeah, wouldn't it be nice? I mean, we have various aspects of our, of our beings, right? So um, we're not inherently rational, uh, nor should we be. But we can use rationality to enhance our lives. We don't want rationality to be the boss, just like we don't want just pure emotion to be the boss. But we are very emotional creatures. Um, and we also have, so we have very strong emotional uh, aspects to ourselves. And we also have something which we can call spiritual, you know, connected to something greater than something within our skins, just merely within our skins. Um, and through community, we're connected to something greater than ourselves. The community is something ineffable, uh, very real in our lives, but uh, bigger than ourselves. But you can't put your finger on what the community is. I see that as spiritual. Um, and there's also political aspects. When we come together, there will be disagreements. There will be places where we overlap and uh, joy results. Uh, but the interactions of ourselves so that we affect uh, not only ourselves but others, this is political. It affects the world around us. All of these things can, if we try, uh, sometimes it actually works that we can uh, uh, fuse all of this together in conjunction for the greater whole. Uh, we can do that individually, we can do that collectively. Uh, you know, we, we're making this stuff up as we go along, right? Uh, if there was ever a time back in the clan days and tribal days of human existence before city-states or whatever, I don't know, we can only conjecture uh, that we were good at community, 
those days are kind of gone, but it's still part of us. You know, we evolve this way, so it's part of our DNA. It's there. We need it. Even if we don't need it to merely survive, we need it to thrive in our lives. So we, we, we're, we're good at it on some deep level, but in the day-to-day -day practicalities, we need practice. So hackerspaces are one place where we can get this practice. And, it, and overall, I mean, there's definitely challenges, but overall it feels really good. And if we can bring all these aspects of ourselves uh, it, to, for the greater whole of ourselves and the people around us, uh, I think uh, amazing things can happen. It, it's what I think magic is all about. So, I mean, you know, you know one of the areas uh, that's a really main focus uh, just for our group and and, I, and I'm hoping that you know for for anyone that this, that's watching uh, this conversation is is putting a priority on on wellness and wholeness and health. I think that um, the the last uh, few minutes uh, that that you know you were sharing that information that your focus was actually uh, directly on that. That's exa that's what I was about to ask you next, and that, that's that's um, you know here we are uh, where this is being deployed, and it sounds to me like we're we're seeing something that's a a real force for uh, cathartic self-development and, you know, personal, uh, possibly healing and... Yeah, well, it's certainly just speaking for myself. Since being involved with uh, all this scene, I've uh, grown tremendously uh, in ways that I, I couldn't even have imagined years ago. Um, you know, growing up, uh, the first half of my life was extremely difficult. Uh, uh, being uh, an introverted geek and gay and horrible at sports and intellectual and all these things that other little kids picked up on and and it's different and as little kids people are exploring differences and poking at what's me what's you and what are the dividing lines how can I affect other people around me uh, what's okay to do what's not okay to do uh, you know and bullies thrive in that environment and uh, and I was horribly bullied and, uh, you know, physically and emotionally abused daily while teachers watched quite often. You know, this is, this is you know, the glories of the school system I was a part of. Um, my parents were depressed. They didn't know what to do. Uh, I was horribly depressed. I didn't know what to do. There just didn't seem to be anything except just wait until uh, my life would finally be over and then I wouldn't have to deal with it anymore. Um, you know, with that kind of background, uh, I had no idea how I would ever live a life that I found way worthwhile. And yet, uh, through a lot of luck and some, uh, and especially luck with having some supportive people in my life, I was able to uh, find ways of eventually living a life I way love living. And I want to share that with other people. Uh, but back uh, when I was a little kid, um, I was in my own little world, you know, just totally in my own little world, which totally sucked as a little kid. Uh, I didn't want to be in my own little world. I wanted to be with other people, but I didn't know how. Yeah, so, yeah, so, uh, you know, as a little kid, it did suck being in my own little world. But as an adult, uh, especially as an inventor, uh, which, which I consider myself, um, uh, it's great. Because I grew up in my own little world with less influence from my peers of the way to look at the world. As a little kid, again, that kind of sucks. But as an adult, having my own way of looking at things is an incredible asset. Um, and um, I can see problems in the world that other people have not seen. You know, like how I make my living is with this keychain called TV Be Gone which is, uh, it's a keychain with one button that turns TVs off in public places. That is a very weird way to make a living. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to do that if I didn't see <laughs> the world in my own way and see that TVs popping up in public places actually is a problem. And it certainly was for me. And, um, and then I found a way, because I'm a geek, uh, of turning them all off. And so I did. And then it turns out that other people like that too. And not only that, but other people can see that there's a problem when they didn't see it before because this device comes in their life. Uh, devices give people permission to see things in different ways, as it turns out. Um, but anyways, doing these kind of things and then sharing it in these communities and seeing just how many people 
pick up on concepts that I've been thinking about all my life, the way I've had healing in my life and able to share that with others feels fantastic for me. And, um, and by being able to share that, that feels fantastic for me. Uh, and somehow that is even more healing for me. And being able to help others create community that's good for them, not just community that's good for me, but help others form community that's good for them so that they can thrive even better in their lives. Somehow I find that healing for me. And when people come into NoiseBridge, the hackerspace in San Francisco that I'm a part of, that I co-founded, um, quite often people have the experience that I felt uh, in my own way the first time I went to the, uh, a hacker conference where the first time in my life I felt really good being in a group. Because uh, being an introverted geek, uh, being in a group, uh, growing up the way I did with bullies, being in a group meant uh, I had to be on guard, right? Uh, you know, that's kind of what my subconscious would say. But suddenly, I'm in a group where everyone's an introverted geek. I don't have to explain myself so much. I don't have to have some kind of even subconscious thing about people are going to think I'm weird for being an introverted geek and who I am. Um, and and you know it brought tears to my eyes it just felt amazing to be in uh this warm fuzzy environment for the first time in my life after living for you know decades and many people have that same experience going to their first hacker uh hacker conference or um hacker space or many people even at maker fairs which are these big uh uh uh, gatherings of people sharing projects of stuff they make, whatever it is. Uh, all this is is really healing, and um, it's also challenging. And overcoming those challenges is also very healing. And it's worth being a part of all this to experience all of that. And then uh, I love sharing it, and so do many, many other people. And they find uh, very much positive uh, reinf a reinforcement for positive aspects of themselves that they may never have dreamed about before doing that. So, um, yeah, you don't know what will happen when you go out into the world and do something. Uh, we have no control over anything in the world. We barely have any control of ourselves. We certainly can't control what we feel. We have very, very little control over what we think. Um, but we have a lot of control over what we choose to do with our time. And uh, we have no control over the consequences of those choices. But, um, but those consequences do exist. And as a result, we think, we feel, and other people we perceive thinking and feeling as a result, some in a big way, some in minor ways. But all of that is new information that we can use to make new choices because we learn a lot from interacting with the world and the consequences of our actions. And uh, if we make choices based on... Um, what we know, what's brought us to where we are, our past experiences, the patterns we perceive. And we make choices trying to make things as best as we can. What's the coolest thing I can possibly do right now? Maybe it's a big thing, like uh, quitting my job and doing something I think is more worthwhile, uh, or getting out of a horrible relationship so I have room to explore better ones, or little things like um, you know, saying someone who I love that I love them or going out and buying fries to eat, whatever. Uh, what's the coolest thing I can do right now? Um, it's not necessarily guaranteed to give us the coolest thing, but we're trying, and then we'll learn from the consequences of our choice, which gives us more information within, you know, from which we can make new choices. And if we do that over time, sometimes we'll mess up, sometimes we'll mess up royally, uh, but sometimes things will work out and we'll learn and maybe we get better at making these choices. And then maybe, hopefully, probably over time, we'll look back and see that our lives have gotten way better 
as a result of that process. And that's an incredibly healing process. It's, I think, a very spiritual process. Uh, it's a process that can help many other people around us because if we're doing well for ourselves, we're doing well for the people around us as well, I think, necessarily, since we're social creatures. And, um, and it feels great. And if we do that in community, then it affects so many more people positively. Our community grows, which attracts more people to give more people opportunity. Um, you know, this stuff's amazing. Uh, again, this is sort of the magic of our existence that we can key into if we want to. You, you know, what's interesting is that um, I, you must be, you know, maybe you're pre-cog or something because I, I have these questions that I want to ask you and it's like you, you begin uh, right away with, with the meat and potatoes. It's fantastic. Uh, you know the 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 last segment that you just did there. I applaud that. Uh, I was I was going to ask you next. Um, you know, what was it? Uh, because one thing I, I haven't heard as much, uh, and I wondered about it. You know, because it's it's an important part. Uh, was what, what was formative? What was what was it that? Uh, you know, the, the whole notion of, of the maker and the hacker space. I think is a, it's a pretty meaningful one. And you know, one thing that struck me too is that. You know, you've, you've gotten global attention, and yet you remain modest, and you remain humble, and so you come across, you know, there's, uh, I, I, a lot of times I'll, I'll just, I'll post little quotes that, that strike me, and so well, one of the quotes that strikes me on a regular basis, it's from the I Ching, and it's, uh, it goes something along the lines of, uh, sincerity towards disintegrating influences is dangerous. Yeah, there, there are probably a bunch of those moments. Um, um... You know, uh, the scenario I painted before is really the process uh, within which I live my life. That, that was really my living philosophy. Uh, life as I see it is a series of choices from uh, which we learn and uh, then make new choices. And that process in and of itself gives my life uh, meaning, meaning that is just fantastic for me. Um, and there's been times when choices that I've made seem to come, uh, you know, the idea for the choice just seems to be a flash of insight. Um, the first choice that I made for myself was extremely influential on the rest of my life. Uh, growing up, like I said, uh, you know, being totally depressed, I really hated myself and being not knowing how to do anything for something positive, I would just withdraw into television. Uh, there was a daily lineup of TV I watched every day. And uh, even as a little kid, I remember telling myself, I don't like this. Why do I do this? Um, and as a little kid, I had no answers, so I kept doing it. Um, but when I was uh, about 20 years old, I asked myself the same question watching a rerun of Gilligan's Island, which was the same show that I asked myself the first time when I was a little kid. Uh, and then I did have an answer. And the answer was, I don't know, but I don't have to keep watching TV anymore. I don't like it. I don't have to keep doing this. It's taking all the time of my life away. And uh, so I went cold turkey. And instantly, uh, I felt horrible because everything that I've been pushing away my whole life had a chance to come screaming in with a vengeance and it needed to all the uncomfortable stuff that was numbed by watching TV um, had space to come up to consciousness and there was nothing I had available to push it away it had a huge effect on me but over time I learned to start to deal with all of that stuff plus I had a lot of time to do more worthwhile things uh, to interact with other people rather than just be afraid of them, um, to stop eating junk food and be more athletic, uh, not competitive, because that's not my nature, but to go out and ride bicycle and do all sorts of physical activity that I find enjoyable uh, and become healthy, more healthy from the food I eat uh, and the activities I do, uh, to be less depressed because the uh, stuff coming at me was from my life rather than from simulated life from a screen showing me that the world out there is a, you know, the screen showed me that the world out there is a scary place and that human endeavor was full of all sorts of negativity because that's what makes good 
drama on TV and sells more product. Uh, in my life, things weren't all negative. Uh, there was a lot of positive things that I could key into, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many benefits that happened from that one choice. And um, uh, pluses and minuses, of course. But I could go with the pluses uh, to the best of my abilities and ameliorate the minuses to the best of my abilities. And so that, that choice was a huge influence. Uh, fast forward many, many years and uh, I had grown to live a life that I really liked, uh, could make enough money in uh, several weeks to a few months to not have to make money in the rest of the year by consulting in electronics. Um, but it was never with projects that made me totally excited. Uh, and it, it took a lot of my time and energy away doing these things, which were kind of okay, working with people I kind of like, but not really exciting for me. I didn't jump out of bed and go, I want to solve these problems. It's really exciting to me. It was like, uh, I guess I have to get up and start working on this stuff. You know, and it's okay. But I wanted a life that's more than okay. So I, I actually had this idea while meditating that I had to follow through, even though it was kind of scary. Uh, I saved up enough money to live a year without having to make money. And I'm, I was lucky enough to be in a position where I could do that. And, um, and I decided for this year, it's an experiment in my life. I will only do what I love. Only do what I love. What would life be like if I spent a year only doing what I love? You know, and laundry and stuff like that, of course. But, uh, you know, in general, only choosing to do what I love, e including ways of making money. So if a job came along that was okay, so it's kind of scary to, to think like turning down work. You know, we're, we're supposed to make money, right? We need money to, to buy shelter, to buy food, to buy things we need for existence. We also need it to buy some things that enhance our lives. You know, if I turn down work that's going to pay me, even if I don't love it, it's just okay, it's okay enough, but I don't love it. I'm turning it down. That's kind of scary. How am I going to make money again? So, uh, but I decided I'm going to follow through with this. I had no idea how I was going to make money. And, um, uh, but I figured somehow there must be a way to support myself doing what I love to keep living, you know? Somehow doing what I love could get me enough of what I need to keep living so I could keep doing what I love. There has to be ways of doing that. And I didn't know what those ways would be. So, but I, I, I was doing a whole bunch of things that I knew I loved, which was a bunch of volunteer work, and I had a whole bunch of stuff like that. Uh, support for emotional support for people with HIV over the phone, uh, um, doing a bicycle coalition to uh, make life better for pedestrians and uh, bicycles, less cars on the street, and um, uh, putting together computers for low-income uh, low people, all sorts of things I love, none of which made me money, but it also, uh, by not working uh, and things that were just okay and you know, having that buffer uh, set aside that I saved up, I had plenty of time to do projects that I had only been thinking about for a long, long time but that I didn't do in electronics because when I worked in electronics, I didn't want to play in electronics. But now I had time and energy to play in electronics. And I did several projects that I've been thinking about, one of which was trip classes, another which was TV Be Gone. And at that moment, TV Be Gone is what got on a roll and I just became obsessed. I wanted to turn off TVs in public places everywhere I went. <laughs> and, uh, and I became obsessed and I made the first one and, and it turned out that friends of mine loved it too. Which makes sense because they're my friends. You know, my friends are as weird as me. Uh, but then it turns out that um, <laughs> my friends' friends mostly all wanted one also, and, uh, and that kind of makes sense too because they're my friends' friends. But when it turned out that my friends' friends' friends, most many of them wanted it, that's when I saw an opportunity, uh. and I made as many as I could afford. Uh, of TV Be Gone remote controls, which turned out yeah. to be twenty thousand, and I figured. That's a gamble, but somehow I could sell 5,000 of them somehow. And if I could do that, I did the math, I could break even. And if I could break even doing something so cool, why not? But it turned out I sold all 20,000 in three weeks. 
And uh, then I had to scramble to create a company out of all this. I was making way more than a living out of it and uh, formed the company with friends who were helping me for free. And um, it's the only way I've made money since 2004 now. It's kind of amazing what can happen when you explore and then do what you love and make choices to the best of your ability to make things cooler. You know, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. And this wouldn't have happened if I didn't make these kind of conscious choices. So, um, you know, and since then, there have been a lot of other choices that I've made that have had, you know, huge detours of where I thought my life was heading. You know, like TV Me Gone back then, I, you know, I'm still an introverted geek. You may not be able to tell by our conversation now, and most people don't believe me when I say it nowadays, but I used to be terrified of people, and I, I really don't thrive in being in a group of people. I thrive being more alone and one-on-one, -on -one, but I love people. You know, I love all of the animals on our planet pretty much. Well, mosquitoes I could do without, but whatever. People are probably my favorite species, um, and I love being with people, but I still am an introverted geek, and if back in the days when I was first doing TV Be Gone, if someone would have told me, this is going to lead you to do public speaking before thousands of people at a time or a million people on TV and radio, uh, I would have done everything in my power to make sure that that did not happen. But now it turns out that I actually like it. Uh, it still scares the hell out of me uh, to go in front of a group, but, um, but I know it'll, it'll be okay because I've had enough positive experience with it and I know I can handle it. Uh, and I know the positive effects from it, not just on me, and, but on others. So it's way worth dealing with my fear of it. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, just a few examples of the uh, kind of things where, uh, you know, just one choice has a, a big influence on my life. And I, as long as I'm alive, I'll keep doing, uh, to the best of my ability, uh, what I love, keep reevaluating that. And new choices are going to happen that come out of left field. And I'm going to go with them and uh, see what happens. And I want to make my life and the life of those around me better. So as long as I'm alive, I'm going to keep making choices that uh, go towards that. Well, I, I can't help but applaud that. I'm happy to do so. I, I, uh, it's funny because I, I feel like you're just, you're like, uh, what's the word? It's like a... It's like a. Do you remember when you were a kid and it was really hot out and they stick the the thing on the on the front lawn and it, it's the rotating spray and the little kids are jumping through it. And, you know they're parched and they're all happy. <laughs> you are you're like a living water sprinkler, man. It's uh, I guess it's, I, it, truly it's fantastic. Well, look, are, are you are you? How do you feel about sure. a few more questions and then we'll wrap it up and and we'll let you have the rest of the evening. Okay. One of you. There's a couple of questions that are just popping to mind. But one thing is. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people go through uh, much of the same kinds of experiences uh, qualitative, you know, qualitatively that, that you've gone through. And uh, I think a lot of what you've been sharing there, I think everything you've been sharing there uh, is going to be helpful uh, and probably on a, I think on a very deep and profound way. But um, if, if there's viewers that are watching this now and, and they're at uh, a place in their lives. Yeah, wow. So, oops, kitty cat's coming in the way. <laughs> So, um, um, yeah, you know, the biggest obstacle for doing what you love in your life um, is probably yourself. Um, there's also external circumstances. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really easy to, to say, uh, for me to say, uh, for anyone to say, you know, you should do what you really love in your life. Uh, it's not necessarily easy to actually do that, though. But boy, it's so way rewarding to try, you know, to make space to explore and to actually do it. Uh, but there are a lot of circumstances, uh, external circumstances in our lives that can uh, get in the way. There's, um, uh, you know, perhaps lack of resources. Um, but if we have, uh, we don't need a whole lot of resources to explore and do what we love. The main thing we need is some time. And uh, there's probably some things that anybody does that um, is maybe not the best thing for, uh, you know, us to be doing right now. Uh, you know, and TV is just one obvious thing as Americans in particular. 
uh, we, we have six and a half hours on average of screen time. And that's not like screens for work. It's just screens that we sit in front of uh, and time goes away when we're in front of them. Maybe some of that time is really awesome. Uh, that's up for each individual to decide for themselves. But uh, you know, if a little bit of that screen time can be put aside to explore something you might enjoy a little bit more, maybe that's worth doing. Um, and um, also hackerspaces are ways, uh, just one example of people pooling resources. When we pool our resources, we can do so much more together than on our own. And we don't need a whole lot of resources to do a lot of amazingly cool things in our lives. Um, you know, and then there's people in our lives that we care about and we want to support them. And, uh, you know, in order to do what you love, you've got to take some risks and taking risks, that's scary. You know, that's why it's called taking a risk and, um, taking a risk on your own time with your own resources is one thing, but when it's the resources, uh, that you share with others to support them, it can be even scarier. That's your responsibility. Hopefully you look at it as a responsibility and not just an obligation, which you feel trapped in. Um, but, you know, if we have people in our lives that we feel responsible for, hopefully it's an interdependence. Uh, they're sharing a lot of cool things with us as well. Uh, the, uh, the thing, if we're responsible for other people, from our side, responsible for other people. Um, we want to be responsible for them in many ways, not just in money and things, but also in, in what we're sharing uh, with them of ourselves and showing them about how we view the world. Um, you know, and if you're a parent, say, and you have kids, if you, you know, if you, uh, are of the uh, opinion that you need to make money to support your kids, um, that's a, an important thing to do. But if you spend more time at work and making money and put all of your attention on making money, um, then that is something that your kids are going to pick up on. And one message they might learn, which is unfortunate about that, is that making money is more important than exploring and doing what you love in your life. I don't think that's a good lesson to be teaching anybody ever. Uh, you know, having enough money is very important in the modern world we live in. But, uh, you know, keep that, keep that in mind as you go along. Keep that in balance. The money isn't the important thing. Money is only a resource that we can choose to spend our time getting so that we can use the money to do awesome in our lives or survival if it comes to that. But, uh, you know, most people, I think, who are listening are beyond survival level. Uh, so it's not just survival, but, you know, it's important to think about things. What do you actually need in your life to do what you really want to do? Um, and not just, you know, make money because that's the default. Um, and then make more money because that's the default. And then make more money because that's the default. And more money because that's the default. You can do that. It's okay. If you want to do that, go for it. See how well that works for you. If it works great for you, then keep doing it. If there's something else you can do that's maybe a little cooler, maybe it's worth trying and see how it goes. Um, one other thing along these ways, whenever you have any kind of goal, the goal can become more important than the steps that you're taking along the way and you lose sight of your life perhaps doing that. Uh, if a goal is important enough to you, Maybe it's worth making some sacrifices along the way, maybe not. But it's important to keep track, I think, along the way of if the goal is still what is important to you and where your life is heading. Um, but along the way, if it still is where you're heading, obstacles will come up. That's inevitable part of life, and there will be ups and downs of life. Um, overcoming obstacles feels great. Um, and... There's a difference, though, between an obstacle and a brick wall so or doors shutting, whichever way you want to look at it. 
Um, if you're going somewhere and doors keep shutting and keep shutting and keep shutting or brick walls sort of drop down out of nowhere and you keep beating your head against it, maybe that's a clue that that's not where your life really needs to head. Um, and only you and you alone can discern the difference. But it's important to think about what those differences might be for you. Or if you knew, like a kid like that, um, what what might you uh, you know suggest to them? Like what 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 are some, or some music, you know, or or some movies, you know, that that you found that were personally inspiring that you might say, hey hey man. You know, listen, I, I know you're feeling down, you know, you're in Japan, you want to get some stuff going together, you're in a tiny little apartment, you don't have enough resources to get your stuff together, you know, you don't have, you don't have the physical space, like, here's a cool movie, here's a, here's a cool book, you know, here's some music that, when I was feeling down, it lifted me. What would be some examples of that? Yeah, well, there's a lot of uh, cool examples uh, of that. Um, yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, the main, depression is, is, is a horrible state. Uh, it, people who've never gone through chronic depression can't possibly understand how horrible it is. Uh, people who haven't gone through it have this notion that, you know, you could just sort of snap out of it. And uh, you can't just snap out of it. Um, at some point, it might just magically go away, but we, we don't have control over that state. It's this vicious cycle of horrible, depressing thoughts uh, that create horrible, depressing brain chemistry that create horrible, depressing thoughts that create horrible, depressing brain chemistry, etc. And while in that state, we are totally unmotivated to do anything. Um, there, there's a great TED talk that I just saw by um, uh, a person whose last name is Solomon. I can't remember his first name, Andrew, maybe. He's an author, and he talks about depression. And he said he'd come home and his answering machine, this is back in the days of answering machines, uh, would be blinking that there's a bunch of people who call. And rather than thinking, oh, cool, I have friends who called me that I can call back, he would think, ugh, that's a lot of people to call. Um, you know, it's totally unmotivating even to call someone that you know and like and love. Um, so, you know, there's so many different things to try, however. Um, if you really need to, I hope, I really hope that you can reach out to someone, someone you know, someone you know just a little, or maybe someone you don't know, maybe a suicide hotline or just a depression hotline um, or on the internet. Just reach out and ask for some support. It's okay. I know in many cultures it's shameful to reach out because it proves that you're weak and that might prove to your, you know, it proves to yourself that you're weak, do you think? It might prove to yourself that um, you're uh, not okay and uh, that you're messed up. Uh, all of these circles that go around in our heads are not really useful. They're there, they're real, but how important are they if reaching out can possibly help you even a little bit maybe it's worth it um you know and no, that, that... there's a bunch of um books and movies that were helpful for me but everyone goes through depression in their own way uh so i don't know if the ones that are good for me have will be good for other people one movie that was really good for me is uh, an, a movie a long time ago, Harold and Maud, uh, about uh, an adolescent uh, who grows up with a uh, in, in, with a controlling family, and um, you know he the family won't allow him to be himself. He has no clue how to be himself, but just sort of randomly he meets this old woman who's a, a total maverick who really encourages him to explore what it is he might love in his life. And, um, yeah, I think it, it's, it's a brilliant film. It's also very funny and entertaining along the way. So uh, it's kind of heavy as well. It goes through all of these emotions, and what you're left with in the end, if it works for you the way it did for me, is wanting to do something new in your life. And 
think that's a great thing. Um, you know, one of the things in my life that has been very, very difficult to deal with is all of the shame I grew up with. Um, you know, being bullied and beaten up and abused emotionally and physically uh, by bullies and um, uh, I internalized that. I really believed that I didn't deserve to live my life. Uh, I was too afraid to kill myself, which I'm grateful for now, um, but I really didn't want to exist. And living this way just filled me full of shame. I, 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 I hated myself. I, I thought I was horrible. I was um, uh, this miserable, uh, you know, turd. And, um, you know, that's, that's sh shame. Uh, that, that it's in my inner core that I, I am horrible. That's what I truly believed. And... Um, it's very difficult to live that way. In fact, in our culture, it's even shameful to feel shame. And it's, it's so dark and horrible that we can't think about it. It's, so, it's, it's the de definition of emotional pain is the shame. And there's this one book which um, I think is very well written called Healing the Shame That Binds Us uh, by a psychiatrist whose name is uh, Levine. And uh, that book helped put a lot of uh, thoughts and feelings together in a way that I could move on uh, to the, uh, another step in my life. Uh, maybe it'll be helpful for other people, too. Um, yeah, and as far as music, you know, we all have very different tastes in music, and uh, my personal taste uh, runs into... Um, very spacey music that allows me to explore inwardly uh, and helps me get into a meditative state. Um, uh, but music that is interesting enough so that it's, it doesn't, my intellect, uh, my conscious mind doesn't go, oh, this is boring. Um, <clears throat> so for me, Brian Eno is one of my heroes who fits the realm of music that's very spacey and beautiful, but it is interesting enough to keep of uh, various aspects of my being uh, attentive and moving in a direction I like. Um, so, uh, but whatever works for you, you know, try things and uh, see what works and what doesn't. Um, if you're in a place where nothing makes any sense at all uh, to try, just try something. It doesn't even matter what it is at that point. It's worth trying something just as the off chance that it might even a little bit uh, help break that cycle of depression enough so that you can start doing something um, a little bit different that can maybe break the cycle a little bit more it's worth trying uh, you have nothing to lose so and a lot to gain and we have the rest of our lives to explore and experiment with and it's worth experimenting. Uh, some things are kind of scary. Maybe it's worth uh, doing it anyways. It's up to you. Uh, it's possible that things can, you know, events happen. We can't predict the future. One thing that we know, though, is if we keep doing the same thing, the same results will probably happen. If we try something new, something new might happen and we can have new experience uh, to draw from that we can maybe have a little bit more positivity. Uh, one thing also, not in the realm of like a book or music or something to do, but uh, one thing that helps me a lot in my life and did also when I was very depressed, a way to feel better about myself was to help others in ways that I could help others. It helped me take the attention off of myself and when you're depressed, you're, you're very, very necessarily self-indulgent because uh, it hurts, you know. It's hard not to pay attention to your pain. But if you can do something positive for someone else who wants, who wants you to try to do something positive for them, that's important. Uh, but if you can do something positive for someone else, it helps take the attention away from you. Plus, if someone is actually benefiting from what you're doing, then that feels good. It feels good to share. It's part of our makeup, you know, as humans on the planet. 
we like sharing what uh, works for us and even what doesn't work for us and let others choose for themselves to see if that's helpful for them. If it is, it feels good. If it doesn't feel good to them, well, at least you tried. Uh, a little bit of attention was taken off of you for a little bit. But if it does help them, it feels even better and it can be very healing. <clears throat> you know, it's funny. <clears throat> uh, I grew up in a small, uh, uh, pretty hard uh, core uh, Canadian prairie town. And it was a factory town. Uh, not, not a big population, uh, pretty isolated. The biggest city was the Fairways. And uh, had a really good dad, uh, you know, good dad, you know, good guy, uh, solid character, kind. Uh, uh, had a mom that was a little bit checked out, so there wasn't much uh, much support there. But you know, say la vie. But I remember a very common experience, especially in grade school. Uh, I would go, and uh, I would often see, and I, this this is pretty much from grade one all the way up to bloody high school. It was just insane. But you know, the kids that were um, they were thoughtful empathic, creative, intuitive, usually the most interesting got hassled the most. And it was usually the ones that were doing the hassling were thick-headed, ignorant, uh, you know, or they or they were themselves brutally scared about something. A lot of times the kids that they picked on, those 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 kids, they in some way threatened them. And I, you know, I mean, I, my approach would be different now. I mean, you know, as an adult, you try to handle things differently. But I'd be in the school field, and I'd, I'd see some cool little, some cool little, you know, guy or, or or some girl being picked on by their peer, and it was like, well, I can either stand here and, and watch this 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 kid that I know is a a cool kid get picked on, or I can go and try and you know, give that bully a good thumping, and I I was never a big fighter in in grade school or high school, but I did a little bit, and there was a couple of times where if I saw someone that was getting picked on, it's like you, you just you got to go do something, you just like you know get get the assholes, you know, off the person's back. And I, you know, I, however we label ourselves is, is our choice. But I, and it's like you said, maybe, you know, if a person sees you at different times of their life, they might, uh, you know, think differently of you as a person. But everything I'm hearing and from my own frame of reference, I doubt you were ever what the pop mainstream calls a geek. I have a feeling that probably what was going on is that you were one of those precious few highly sensitive people that w were empathic, had a whole lot more going on inside their head and inside their heart and inside their soul, and you were a target. You know, the, there's a lot of crazy psychopaths, and they have children, and they like to feed off the energy of good-hearted people like you, and I, I'm glad that you stuck around. I'm glad that you, uh, that you, you know, you had the courage and the, and the balls and the backbone to make it through that, and, so, and you've made an amazing contribution to the world, Mitch. You know, I, it's you. a heroic and you're modest about it and so that's the sign of character so listen um if people want want to get involved with hackerspace or or the the maker movements uh, what what are some steps that they can do that in like what 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 do they need to do um <clears throat> you know there's hackerspaces all over the world but there's a lot of places where they're not but if you want to see if there's one near you or wherever you travel you're always welcome at that hackerspace so look up you know whatever town you're in just town name Hackerspace. Put that in your favorite search engine. You can also go to hackerspaces.org, which is a central uh, networking place for hackerspaces. There's even an email list on uh, hackerspaces.org that you can get on if you want to learn more. You can ask people questions there. You can also email me, Mitch, at cornfieldelectronics.com. Um, and the thing is, if there is a hackerspace near you, Go there, see if it's one you like, and uh, see if the community is one that's supportive for what you want to be doing uh, maybe in your life. If there isn't one, start one. <clears throat> that is exactly the way hackerspaces start, is people like you make one. Um, you know, it doesn't take anyone totally special. Um, we're all special each in our own way, but it doesn't take someone totally special uh, to do it. It just takes you. And um, there's a world of hackerspaces willing to help you do it if you want to do it. Um, there's also hacker conferences all over the world. Many of them are totally cool uh, communities that will uh, embrace you with open arms and ready to share whatever kind of projects they have. There are also maker fairs uh, happening uh, big ones, like in the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area, but a lot of mini ones <clears throat> that are put on by local communities. 
and uh, you can check them out. Just you know, look for that. Uh, you know, your town name, Maker Fair, or state or province name, Maker Fair, and see what comes up. Or Hacker Conference. <clears throat> There's cool people doing amazingly cool things all over the place, and it would be great, I think, if you were one of them whoever you are uh and if you're already doing cool things maybe you can do more cool things um you know it's uh no matter how cool your life is it can always be at least a little bit cooler uh so go for it do cool stuff and you know live your life see what happens uh as long as you're alive you can keep doing that and uh i'd like to encourage you. uh Mitch, I just wanted to say it was a, it's a, been an honor and a real pleasure, and I, and I thank you so much for taking time out to talk with us. Um, can you uh, can you share us the, uh, the websites again uh, just before we, we sign off? Yeah, so um, uh, my website is cornfieldelectronics.com. Uh, there's also for hackerspaces, uh, hackerspaces.org. Uh, there's a website that I'm now currently working on uh, to get people uh, to give people opportunities to be a hacker in residence anywhere in the world. There are uh, a growing number of residency opportunities where you can go and share what you know and learn from others. Um, some all expenses paid in various interesting parts of the world. Some no expenses, but anywhere in between. And that is hackerinresidence.org. Um, so... Um, uh, yeah, those are the websites I can think of at the moment. Uh, if you have any others you want to add, feel free. Mitch, thanks so much again. You have a super night, and uh, I look forward to maybe, maybe we can have a chat again sometime in the future. And and uh, oh, I'd you know, love that. Yeah, carry on. And so, and I really uh, I appreciate also just you know the occur uh, encouragement and the inspiration that you gave to our viewers. It's uh, it means a lot to everyone. Cool. Well, it, it it means a lot to me too, and I, I love doing this, and I do what I love. So. Uh, Thanks for having me. Be well, Mitch. Take care. Talk soon.